Bagel Nayang Jimbalungs. G'day friends. My name is John Graham. I'm a proud Kumba Mary man, a saltwater man of the Gold Coast region. Our people are part of the wider Yugambeh language group. The Kumba Mary lands stretch from the Gumara Gumara, the Kumara River to the north, down to the Tweed River in the south, bordered by the beautiful Pacific Ocean and the foothills of the Great Dividing Range. I'd like to acknowledge my elders past, present and emerging for, as I say, it all welcomes. It is important to recognise the hard work that our old people did in dark times. And we continue that legacy into today so that we can also pass on that reconciled state onto our young people because they're the bearers of the flame, the keepers of the knowledge and keep our culture strong into the future. I'd also like to pay my respects to the spirit of this land and her people, which includes all of you here today. My authority to speak today comes from Waru, my apical ancestor, whose connection through her daughter, Jenny Graham, passed on through Frank, Jack and Leonard Graham, my father, allows me to speak with authority uh, on Kumamari land uh, and so that we uh, acknowledge this place. Please respect this place as you go about your business and walk within our lands because that respect is reciprocal. We need you to maintain that reciprocity while you are within Kumba Mary lands and other places on other campuses that people may be studying on. Welcome to this country. It's a special place. Please respect each other, respect the country and her people and the fauna and flora. It's important that you do this, that we maintain this into the future. Anyabu, anyabu, until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle John. Thanks, Samia. So next, I would like to, uh, my name's Oops, sorry. My name's Louise and this is Samia and we're just from the Service Learning Unit. So we're just here, we're going to help you through the webinar and anything like that and pass on any information. So now I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Stephen Billett. Um, Dr. Stephen Billett is a Professor of Adult and Vocational Education in the School of Education and Professional Studies at Griffith University. He's a National Teaching Fellow and Australian Research Council Future Fellow. After a career in garment manufacturing, he's worked as a vocational educator, educational administrator, teacher educator, professional development practitioner, and a policy developer in the Australian vocational education system as a teacher and research at Griffith University. So we'd like now to introduce Professor Stephen Billett and we can now move on with our uh, webinar series. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Louise, and thanks, Samia. Um, Yes, we've had a fun morning this morning because um, I've come into work at the university to get good connectivity and we've had an outage. So currently I'm using my mobile telephone as a hotspot to do this presentation. So hopefully everything will go smooth. However, uh, I'm gonna start by sharing my screen with you. And, and I hope this is the screen to be shared. You know, there's always two and one works and one doesn't. So let's just hope this is the one that that works. Uh, yeah, and great, this is the one that works. Look, um, thanks very much for coming along. And this series, this series of three um, webinars um, is uh, a COVID safe uh, dissemination strategy. The original intention is that the, these series of talks were to be a part of a face-to-face dis -face dissemination process arising from the OLT grant on augmenting students' learning through post-practicum um, interventions. However, as you know, mobility is not possible, so we've decided to do this webinar. It's a great strategy because we're going to have three different strategies rather than one focus. And what we've got is three webinars. The first one, which is the one today, is going to be on the purposes of having post-practicum interventions. And the, the, the focus question for today and the, the presentation and then the, the workshop that can, uh, follows after the presentation is for what purposes and through what approaches would post-practicum interventions be effective in, in your uh, field of teaching? 
And then next week, we're going to have uh, the second webinar, which will be on models and processes of post-practicum interventions, the different approaches that were taken in this very large teaching and learning grant, which had 14 projects in the first phase and then uh, about 30 in the second phase, and looking at the different approaches that were taken by um, academics across uh, 25 disciplines and across 19 Australian universities. And the question for ne next week will be, what are the qualities of the models of post-practicum interventions um, that would be effective for your area of teaching? And then the third webinar, which will be in um, two weeks time uh, on the 24th of November, addresses this issue about how can we most effectively engage with our students and current students are not time poor, it seems, but they're time jealous, how they and use their time very strategically. So how can we come to engage with them and um, utilizing their experiences in the workplace and optimizing those experiences for people who are very careful about their time. And this has come up as being a key focus, um, a key issue within this project. Um, and then so the question for that third webinar is how can contemporary time jail students be assisted to engage in post-practicum activities to achieve effective outcomes? Okay, so that's where we're at. So today, the, the key focus then is on post-practicum interventions and their purposes of them. And this sits within a broad educational goal or broad educational project associated with integrating experiences that students have in the work settings and how they, those experiences can be augmented and enriched to generate employability outcomes for our students. And what we are aware of is that huge amounts of institutional and personal resources are being invested in providing higher education students with workplace experiences. And these are directed towards their preparedness for the world of work and engagement in specific um, occupations and the term that's being used now is, is is job readiness and you'll be aware that the recent initiatives from um, the federal government um, the ones that have just been recently announced are about um, focusing on work integrated learning promoting job readiness for university graduates and this is part of Minister Tiernan's uh, approach for perhaps reforms to higher education um, and the, the emphasis here are, is on integrating students' experiences. And so that is within work integrated education, the provision of ex educational experiences to achieve that outcome. And, and although the, the practices for doing so require the elaboration of, of those, those experiences to achieve particular learning outcomes or educational goals. So a key element of, um, of work in integrated education is using students' work experiences to promote those outcomes. And from earlier work, as I'll elaborate shortly, these post-practicum interventions are seen as being an effective way of achieving that is that is interventions once the students have had uh, workplace experiences. And so across the three webinars, as I've said, we'll be talking about the kind of goals, the kind of processes that can be used and issues associated with engaging students. So that's a bit of the background. And this one's on the purposes. So um, a key goal for higher education in the, in the modern and contemporary era has been to prepare graduates for occupations. And this has led then to a focus on you know, developing occupational standards and courses being directed towards achieving those. Some sectors such as teaching and nursing, et cetera, have, have you know, national standards that these courses are directed towards or state-based standards that these courses are directed towards. So for much of the last, two decades, three decades, there's been a strong focus, a growing focus on preparing people for occupations. However, increasingly, and as has been doubled down just recently by um, uh, the, the new reforms, is that employers, governments and community and students 
now expect that graduates from higher education will be job ready. Now, there is um, a difference, a big difference between um, being prepared for an occupation and being job ready. And that is, you know, that is because, for instance, that the requirements for a particular job um, will only be known um, once the students actually come to engage in that kind of work. Occupational practice isn't uniform across different workplaces. Uh, what the kind of work that a nurse does, for instance, in a major teaching hospital, a tertiary hospital in, in the Gold Coast, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, et cetera, is quite different to what they do in small regional hospitals, is quite different than what happens in a practice nurse in a, a doctor's surgery, et cetera. So an occupation is practiced in different ways. And up until now, the request has been that our graduates be prepared for occupations. But now increasingly what is being suggested is that they need to be prepared for a particular job. Yet we, we'll, you know, we won't know where the students will be employed until of course they graduate. And this then requires a different set of educational goals than, than preparing people for an occupation. And it, I guess it, 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 it suggests that we have to prepare our students to be more adaptable. And that is not just having the canons of the occupation, but knowing how that occupation is practiced in different circumstances. And so sitting within that is the concept of adaptability. So that the students have profound understandings about their occupation, but have also the ability to understand that in different work situations, their occupation will be practiced in different ways, for, for often for very good reasons. Um, how it, however, it's important that you know we how we think about the um, the purposes that students need to achieve, and that this then directs our thinking about how we how we provide our education experiences and how we seek to augment them. So, what we know is that educational provision should always be intentional. There should be clear goals for them, and those aiming to generate specific, specific occupational capacities have particular educational purposes. Now, much of what I focus on is the, the development of, 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 of the knowledge for work. And part of that is identifying the canonical occupational knowledge. That is the knowledge that anybody who's practicing a particular occupation has to have. And that is what they need to, to know, to be able to do and to value. And those, those forms of knowledge are in three, three, three kinds. Firstly, there's conceptual knowledge, which is factual um, knowledge about knowledge that we can state and causal knowledge, understanding the relationship between things. So if, a, if there's an issue here, how the, another factor needs to be taken into consideration. Procedural knowledge is that what we actually use to achieve goals. It's the, the thinking and acting that we do to actually achieve outcomes. And then there's the dispositional qualities as interest and intentionalities of how we go about undertaking those tasks. So for instance, there's conceptual knowledge associated, if you continue to use the example of a nurse, of, 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 of conditions that a patient might have there's procedural knowledge associated with how you respond to that and very specific procedures about dressings and that sort of thing through to strategic procedures, which is about patient care over a period of time. And then there's values and dispositions about how you engage with patients and the care you direct towards them. And these are often captured within documents that are the professional standards which our courses seek to achieve in occupations such as teaching and nursing, et cetera. And however, what we know is that now there's this press for making our graduates job ready, there's a need to understand and take account for the situational manifestations of that knowledge, because as I've said, um, how that knowledge is actually required and manifests in workplace is, 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 is different. So we need to know that there are what, what is required for, for permits job performance in a particular situation and what, what has to be particularly known in that workplace, it can be done in that workplace and can be valued. 
So, you know, the practices, for instance, in aged care might be quite different than in the critical uh, care facility that nurses might, might work in. And it's so important to remember that there is no such thing as a, an occupational expert per se, is that occupational practice is enacted in particular situations and expertise is really the ability to, to respond effectively to non-routine problems. And you know, that those problems only emerge in, in particular situations and we have to respond to those. So for instance, at the moment, there's been huge changes occurring in, in, in healthcare, as you're all aware. And I've got a project currently working with in uh, general practice across um, rural communities. And the, the practices had to change to adopt to the needs of you know, tele, telehealth and working with patients at a distance. And so the work, for instance, not only of doctors has changed, but the work of of receptionists has had to change, uh, nurse practitioners and also practice managers. And they've had to change in particular ways because they're in rural communities. And so these educational intents then need to include students learning to adapt their canonical knowledge um, to occupational variations. Now, I actually think this is a good thing because um, it's part of of higher education that the knowledge that we provide for our students shouldn't be fixed it should be able to be used by them in different ways to respond to existing and emerging problems and so a focus on adaptability seems to be you know i think a, a part of what you might expect within higher education and developing such adaptability there becomes a, a focus for curriculum and pedagogy such as the use of post practicum interventions okay so there are just some background now here's some quick precepts and premises about how we might progress firstly um, learning arises through experiencing the process of having an experience and doing something with it and how we construe and construct um, our experience from 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 what we encounter and the degree of its invitational qualities the degree by which the person's invited to engage the degree by which the person is able to engage because they have the ability to understand and engage and it's it's very important to remember that educational provisions are nothing more or less than an invitation to change and ultimately it's going to be up to the students about how they come to engage because we can only provide experiences and ultimately it's the students that will elect how they come to engage with it and that's why when we find that students are increasingly time jealous that this is then a central concern for higher education and that although much is made of having independent learners that we also need learn to develop our students as being interdependent, that is engaging with others, with technologies, with artifacts to learn, because increasingly that is what happens in workplaces where people work across teams and work with others and need to access knowledge from others. So interdependence is as valued as independence in, in learners. And, um, it's important to remember that the integration of, of experiences is something that people do. It's, it's a personal fact. Uh, the person will actually reconcile the experiences they've had in particular ways. And therefore, I think it's helpful to distinguish between work integrated learning, which is a personal process of learning and work integrated education, which is the provision of experiences. I, I want to make this point because that I think it's it's all too often when I, I, I read stuff about um, work integrated learning, an awful lot of it actually refers to work integrated education about the provision of experiences. And it's important that we realize on the one hand, there's an educational provision, but work integrated learning is how the person seeks to integrate the experiences to reconcile them and learn from them. And there's two different considerations there. You know, we, and there has to be student engagement and agency because 
um, it's that agency and that uh, intentionality which actually supports rich and effective learning. Also, um, demanding learning is not easy, it's effortful, and it will only occur if students engage effortfully in the task. So it has to be something which um, students will, you know, press themselves into engaging effortfully. And also the need for engaging interdependently with others in a constructive and um, engaging way. And what we know, however, there are a series of barriers for this to occurring. There can be caution, there can be concerns about how the person engages, there can be you know, um, doubts, there can be time jealousy, not only of students, but also teachers. And we also know that there's resource jealousy, that workplaces are simply unable to provide the, the whole range of experiences which high schools, uh, vocational education institutions and higher education institutions are asking of them. And so, for instance, in, in some fields, the amount of time that, um, that students are able to spend in workplaces being restricted, which presents other educational challenges for us. And I guess what we're going to be aware of increasingly is that universities are going to be resource jealous because of the financial constraints that, that, that have arisen. So time jealous students and perhaps time jealous teachers. And all of this suggests that we need to be very careful and considered about the educational purposes of, uh, of, of the programs, but also what engages students. Okay, so this particular project arose from an earlier project that was looking at curriculum and pedagogic practices for integrating practice-based experiences that involved um, 20 projects across six Australian universities. It occurred between 2009 and 2010. And this was about you know, developing capacities to enact work integrated learning. And this was a shared activity across those universities and those programs. And one of the key findings of that project was that there were things that happened before, needed to happen before students went into the workplace, things during and things that occurred after the practicum. And I've handed out the, a set of practice guidelines which came from that project as a, a resource for this workshop. But it was during this that uh, we realized that the, the potency of post-practicum interventions, and on a number of talks, I've said, if I only had $1 to spend, I'd be spending it on having something when the students have had their work experience, because then they've got something to make sense of, they've got something then to compare and contrast with others um, and engage with others to consider their experiences. So, what came from that study was the, the potential it was identified of these post-practicum interventions once the students had had their workplace experiences. Um, and what came out of that project that there was a set of educational purposes for engaging in work integrated education. And they're listed here, learning about an occupation, learning about variation, various manifestations of that occupation, extending the knowledge learned in university settings, an orientation to the place where occupations are practiced, building occupational capacities to actually achieve those, um, to be able to uh, practice the occupation, and then developing more broadly applicable learning that could be um, adaptable to the particular, to the circumstances where students find employment, and then meeting the requirements of occupational, professional licensing. Now, looking down this list, what you can see is that quite different experiences will be required to achieve those outcomes. One is about an orientation to occupations. Another is about the period, the, the process of learning how to, to you know, perform that occupation. Quite different considerations in terms of duration, etc. 
Um, the key findings of that study, which I'm going to go through very quickly, is that just having workplace experience is insufficient. They need to be augmented. And the importance of preparing students for, during, um, and after to connect the experience. The importance of student readiness, of actually them being able to effectively engage and having enough sufficient knowledge um, to, to, to make sense of the experiences and to benefit from those experiences and to manage time jealous students. Way back then, this issue came up. And, and also educators' concepts and worth of practice-based experiences within higher education was, was identified as being quite diverse. You know, as within many, many elements of the education community, um, what happens in education institutions was valued and what happens in the workplace was often seen to be um, subordinate and less important. And considerations of the experience curriculum, the sense that students make of the experiences that they have came to the fore. And the importance of incremental exposure of practice-based experiences. And that is students said they didn't want to be thrown in the deep end. They wanted, um, you know, an incremental engagement in workplace activities so that their engagement could be productive and effective. And preparing students for workplace experiences, but also reconciling when they have difficult experiences because sometimes students report the work experience isn't, isn't always positive. And so we need to manage that process. So this then led to a consideration saying that if we are um, with all these different kinds of educational purposes, there's a set of different educational processes that we need to consider. And in this table, which I'll simply indicate to, and of course this overhead will be available for you, what you can see is there's quite different um, considerations for curriculum um, arising from these educational purposes. So it can be, you know, the issues of timing and sequencing, when will it occur, um, the duration, the length of it, how it's organized, um, the kind of engagement which is likely to be helpful and the kinds of experiences that are likely to, to address the educational purpose. So this table is simply to indicate that there are these different purposes and um, they have quite different implications for for how we go about our work as educators. Okay, but let's move on now to this current project. And this is a project that was funded by the um, Office of Learning and Teaching before it um, closed. And um, unfortunately, it was um, you know, probably one of the last projects that was funded by the OLT. And um, that's an, a great shame, but it did allow a lot of people to come together to work on a common problem. And so the project's aim was to how to promote student learning associated with employability through post-practicum interventions. And it started off by having a developmental conference where um, in the first phase, I'll just go on to that, the first round, there were 14 projects across health and, and, and social care. And what we did was we all came together and talked about how we would go about this task, the kind of projects we would have. And then those projects were enacted over the, the following year. And then the, we brought then in a group of additional uh, 30 projects. And what happened that we had a dialogue forum where the people involved in the first 14 projects reported their, their processes as much as their findings. Um, to the, the, the audience, which were these people who came in who were going to lead 30 projects in the following year. And so those, the feedback from the first rounds was used and uh, the participants engaged with them. And then in the second round were 30 projects across a whole diverse field of, of academic disciplines, not just in health and social care. And there was a variety of approaches adopted um, to you know, in those projects to achieve particular kinds of, of outcomes. And we also, in the beginning of the study, ran a student survey. And that is we wanted to find out what the students wanted from post-practicum experiences, because as I've been emphasizing, 
Students are ultimately those who learn, and we know that they're confronted by competing demands, hence that they've become often time jealous. And we were concerned to find out from, from what purposes students want to engage in practicum experiences and, um, and how they wanted to engage, what kind of processes. So the survey's findings were as follows, that um, the students reported that they really wanted um, purposes that assist them gauge their, under, help them understand how well they were progressing towards being an effective you know, um, healthcare practitioner. I should add, by the way, that in this survey, we focused on students in the healthcare sectors. So medical nurses, midwifery, physio, uh, diet, dietetic students, etc. And they really wanted feedback on how they were developing and how to further their development and also their readiness to secure employment uh, upon the completion of their course. So they were quite focused and, and quite pragmatic. Um, in terms of their preference for processes, they wanted those that were led and facilitated by academics or um, clinicians. They wanted them by expert others. Um, they wanted advice and surety from um, experts about their progress. And they preferred those over um, student-led or organized processes. And this person in particular was hoping that the students would warm to the idea of engaging in peer-led processes. And uh, that wasn't to be the case. And of course, you're, you're conscious that what the students wanted in some sense was virtually one-on-ones with um, their teachers and clinical supervisors. And of course, that's, the, you know, that's very difficult to resource um, over a, a long period of time and to very large numbers of students. So um, what this emphasizes is the importance of aligning um, the, the purposes that are required with the kind of experiences that are provided. And as I've said, students place low value on peer assistance. And as I've said, this contradicted much of what a person like myself was hoping for, and also what some of the literature was saying about um, students being able to engage in you know, particular peer-led processes. Um, these are the list of the things that the students talked about in terms of what they wanted to achieve through um, these are the purposes that they want to achieve through the post-practicum interventions. And you can see them there, discussing experiences during placement that were interesting, worthwhile, confronting. Link what is being taught at university to practice, learn more about preferred occupation, um, learn more about other students' experiences, learn about preferred occupations, how they're practiced in different settings, secure feedback on workplace um, experiences and identify how um, these experiences can make you more employable, make more in informed choices about career and work, work options and specialization and make choices about the, uh, the subsequent courses and to improve the experiences for the next cohort of students. So you can see that these are the kind of things which the students suggested that they wanted to get out of the post-practicum experience. And it was interesting looking at the weightings of these and um, we asked them to rate their responses to these in terms of what would be of interest to them and what would be of, um, um, of limited interest to them. By the way, we also had in the scale, uh, and that'll be mentioned subsequently in subsequent modules, where they were where they indicated they would not participate, and there were some things which they strongly said they would not participate. So you, here you can see that list that students have given um, values and frequency to of what they found interesting and worthwhile, and there isn't a huge range of weightings, but you can see this listing here has the ones at the top that overall are, um, if you add in very interested, some interest and interest, the, the, it's, it's ranked accordingly. And so it's helping make informed choices about career work options. That's the top one. And then identify how you can be made more employable. 
and securing feedback from the workplace experience and learning more about the preferred occupation. So there are sort of concerns from the, from the students about wanting to get feedback and wanting to know how they're going, progressing towards graduation and the prospects of employability. It was interesting, we did an analysis of the nursing students who were the biggest cohort to see if there was difference across the age cohort. Um, and that was, as you probably, many of you be aware, there's often two cohorts in nursing courses, that is the young school leavers and those who have come in from the enrolled nurse route, which is they've done vocational education, then they come into university. And, and the second group have had a, a lot of, um, a lot of well, some, some of them have had a lot of practical experience. And we, we looked to see if there was difference in terms of what they were um, seeking from the courses. And we also looked at the, at the across the ages to see whether there was different expectations and different concerns from first year students um, as opposed to the fourth year students. And there were some variations, but overall there was, there was this set of considerations about progress, how people were going, how, how they were progressing and what that feedback would say in terms of them being employed upon graduation. That was all fairly consistent. Um, it's also worth noting that, and this is from the first phase projects, that we then mapped the, the things that the students wanted to see how these align to the projects. And you'll see here that, and the names on the right hand side are the, the names of the person leading those projects. And we were able to identify that there were, while there were goals within the particular projects that the um, uh, the, the, the 14 projects for, for their own purposes, there was also an alignment with the educational purposes that the students wanted themselves. Um, and um, we also looked then to see the way that these particular approaches to um, um, uh, the post-practicum interventions were aligned with the development of the specific kinds of knowledge, which I mentioned earlier. And you'll see down here, there's a description of the focus of these, um, of these um, interventions. So, you know, Levitt Jones was on improving clinical reasoning, and that used a process of oral presentations by the nursing students. And that was developing procedural and conceptual knowledge um, we held. And then there was others associated with developing understandings about working interprofessionally. That was the one that Gary Rogers led, working with, with um, uh, students working interprofessionally. And there was particular kinds of learning that uh, we identified there. Um, then there was Harrison's, um, uh, which were, was with medical students, um, utilizing and extending clinical knowledge through particular kinds of interventions etc etc so what there was was all these different kinds of um, focuses for these projects and you can see in the right hand column the kinds of knowledge that they developed then um, here and even more information is that the actual strategy that was used to achieve these and we'll be covering more of this in the second uh, webinar, but what you will see here looking across um, some of the examples was that, um, um, say for instance, we take the third one down, utilizing and extending clinical students' clinical knowledge. And this was run by Harrison at, and she was dealing with, um, at, sorry, she was working with um, medical students and medical students are some of the most time jealous students. They're very precious about their time because of the demands that they have upon them. And here she um, put in place um, an initiative which provided them with um, an experience that in some sense they had to attend because there was information they needed. And then she provided an environment in which the, the students could have in groups open discussions about experiences they'd had recently in their clinical work. 
and the combination of the two things together, some you know, input to use that kind of language, but also the students coming to engage with others and share in, in what was really a psychologically safe space so that they could talk to others about the mistakes they'd made, the uncertainties they had, the, the stress they were encountering, et cetera. So there was a particular um, set of experiences that was provided uh, for them. And then if we go right down, say for instance, looking at developing students' feedback literacy, that was a, a project that was run by uh, Christy Noble in a hospital setting. And this was encouraging students to take a more active and engaged approach to feedback. And so it was a structured experience that um, students were provided with some initial information online, a workshop, and then <clears throat> they engaged in processes of where they not only waited to feedback, but sought out feedback and understood the qualities of feedback. So what here is then there's a set of educational purposes in the left hand column and in that central column, how those those purposes were being um, en enacted. And from all of this, there are some key issues that came out and we're going to hopefully have the opportunity to discuss these in, in more detail shortly. Firstly, um, learner expectations these are some of the things that came out. Students often value these interventions when they built capacities to practice their preferred occupation and in ways that address their personal readiness and stage of professional preparation. So when there was good alignment amongst the experience provided, where the students were at, their sets of concerns, students said that they, they found these experiences really helpful. Um, in readiness, that the students had to be um, adequately prepared so that they could engage effectively in, in the practicum, but also the post-practicum experiences that, um, that, that they were engaged in after the event. And um, when there was a lack of readiness, when the students were unprepared or didn't have the capacities, not only for the practicum, but also to engage in the activity that they'd been asked to participate in, that caused some difficulties. So for instance, in one of the, um, in one of the projects, the students had to make a video. Now there were some great videos, but students who didn't have the skills to make a video found that to be a significant challenge. So the actual, their lack of readiness with the technology didn't permit them to make the most of that experience. Um, and the importance of student engagements and unless the students see worth and value in the activity being provided, they're likely to engage uh, superficially perhaps at best because they need to be there or they need to pass an assessment task but there was a lot of feedback that students would only really engage if there was in these activities if there was something purposeful for them um engagement in interventions um you know uh, this issue then if you make it compulsory they have to attend and have to engage you might just get superficial activities. If you make it voluntary, the students engage, but then perhaps some of the um, participants um, won't engage and perhaps the ones who most need to engage are the ones that don't engage. So this quandary then, do you make it compulsory or do you make it um, elective? Now Harrison, for instance, in her approach, she actually structured it so that the students had to attend but also provided something that they found very helpful and very useful. And so the two things came together. But it's this quandary about making something compulsory, superficial compliance, make something voluntary, and perhaps those who most need to attend don't attend. And having a, a safe environment in which students can come to share and compare and contrast in a way that they feel they're not being judged um, and this won't be used um, to mark them or grade them in any way, or in the case of the healthcare students, um, feedback reaching clinical settings, et cetera. So providing a psychologically safe um, experience. So in one of the projects, they had a, a group activity, and this was for the speech pathology students. 
And what they had was a, at the end of the year, a day when all the students reflected upon and engaged and discussed and compared and contrasted their experiences. And they started off in pairs and then they went into small groups and then into larger groups. But the rule that was established is that while I might want to share something with uh, Samia personally, I might not want that to be shared with a larger group. And so there was a rule established about what was shareable beyond the group. But that allowed a sort of chain process of the sharing of experiences. And, and you know, having designing and enacting interventions that were central to the students' needs, that they weren't just to be any kind of interventions, but interventions that were deemed to be helpful. So the one I referred to at the beginning by <clears throat> Levitt Jones, um, they're the students, rather than providing a, a written statement about a clinical assessment they'd done, they actually had to give it orally. Now, the point is that a nurse on a hospital ward has to be able to do that with confidence to a doctor, for instance. And so by shifting the focus from the written um, assignment to actually having to present a case orally, that was something aligned with the kind of capacities that the, a nurse would need. So there was that kind of alignment, which uh, I think was, was, was important. Okay, and in sum, so the need to align work integrated learning with the, the intended purposes to be achieved and those that will encourage student engagement um, seem to be um, important. That is to assist students effectively engage in work integrated learning. And that there are clear roles in, in addressing both of these purposes. That is achieving the, um, the goals that the course needs to achieve, but also responding to the kind of purposes that the students want to achieve. And assisting students identify the purposes and processes with their, and, and directing their efforts uh, towards them and assist students developing the canonical occupational knowledge, the canons of the occupation, which everybody needs to develop, but also making them aware of the different circumstances in which the, um, uh, the, their occupation is practiced. And one of the great things about the post-practical experience is that you have students who've engaged in different kinds of workplaces where the occupational knowledge is practiced. And by coming together, they can share those experiences so vicariously students can come to experience a whole different set of ways in which the particular occupational knowledge is being, um, is being um, enacted. And then um, assisting students make transitions into their target occupation uh, as, a, as, as a foundation for their ongoing development. So by getting them to think about adapting their knowledge to what they've learned into the particular situation, setting all that up, provides a foundation for their own ongoing development beyond their initial employment because the requirements for work um, are constantly changing as we know very well from the uh, coronavirus era that we unfortunately find ourselves in at this point. Okay, in this way then work integrated education can realize societal as well as personal goals. So societal goals of preparing people to be effective occupational practitioners and also helping individuals achieve the goals that they want to secure an effective um, uh, work life and career. Okay, so what we might do now is me stop talking and um, hopefully engage in some discussion. And then we've got a, um, a group process activity and depending how many folk are here, we can either go in groups and, and discuss these or we can discuss it um, as per a forum. So um, let's stop sharing and hopefully I can see some faces and hopefully there'll be some questions which um, uh, I'll be able to address. And I'm astonished that I've got this far using my mobile phone here as a, as a source for the interconnectivity and so fingers crossed that that, that persists. So um, I went through a lot of material there, it, it's, it'll be all available to you. Um, perhaps we have some questions that people would like to raise or clarifications about 
what I've said and, and presented in quite a speedy fashion. I'm now getting a message saying that my internet is unstable, so um, um, let's hope all goes well. So questions, please, or clarifications. I have been known to point, by the way, so, um, so please, somebody, if just one person starts, it'll all flow on. Faith has got a question. Thank you, Faith. You need to, ah, thank you. Yeah. I've, un I've unmuted. Um, thank you, Professor Billet. That was quite enlightening for me. And um, I guess my question is when you're looking at the post practicum benefits of work integrated learning, if you're new to setting up a will course, most people are kind of focused on the getting the experience happening. Do you have a structure or that you recommend for, for practitioners or people delivering will courses? What's your preferred? I know there's like the reflective debriefing or the, what's, what do you feel has the most impact for students? Well, uh, there's the three phases. Firstly, I think there's preparation before the students go in of putting them in a position so they can actually do something constructive in the workplace. Um, but also have some means to actually engage and make sense of the experience. So, yeah, you know, a, a project or a, a focus for their engagement. And I'll come back to that in a second. The second thing then is having a um, some kind of engagement during the practicum, because many many students reported feeling terribly lonely during their practicum. And then, thirdly. Um, having a, a range of options for the post practicum experiences. Now, uh, I want to go back to the first one, first of all, and that is that having a focus to engage in the workplace seems to be particularly important. Not just go along and have work experience, but actually have a focus. It might not work out as you intended, but to have a game plan. Um, and the example I use is that um, I was seeing a group of, <clears throat> I was sitting in on what's called a handover in a, in a hospital quite a few years ago now, um, where the nurses from one shift are handing over the, the, the care of the cases to the incoming shift of nurses, it's called a handover process. And there's, there's five considerations, the patient, the conditions they have, the treatments they're having, um, the, the predictions about where they're going and then the, the prognosis. Now, in these, these meetings stop and start, and there were two nursing students um, sitting in, and these meetings stop and start. So one of the students who was sitting next to me leant over to the other student and said, let's go. And it just seemed to me that they didn't have a plan. They didn't know why they were there. And what I was seeing was this incredibly rich learning situation occurring where these cases were being discussed, the nuances of the particular treatments, people making judgments about where the patient would be at the end of the shift or by, by tomorrow. I mean, these are powerful learning experiences. Had those students been sent into that practicum with an under to state, those, those five principles, how do they play out for each of the patients being discussed? But also your job will be virtually to look after patient number three or number four and how they might have engaged and engaged in that process. So I think, having some kind of process reason and purpose for engagement to enrich the experience is important. Coming back to whether you should do debriefs and clinical reflection, I think it depends a lot on, um, on the particular learning experience and the kind of purposes you want to achieve. And hence, when we did these uh, 14 first projects and then 30 projects that followed, the whole idea was for people to experiment with different approaches, some of which were successful. I think some of them weren't successful, but the idea was there were particular goals that people wanted to achieve. So for instance, Jenny Newton used videos, um, students going into residential, nursing students going into residential care because this is seen as being low status nursing work, not attractive nursing work. And so she got them to take videos of their experiences and it worked for some, but for others it didn't work. But what this was trying to bring in and change the views about that kind of nursing, which is seen as being low status. Hence, um, to sort of answer your question more succinctly, I think it says 
that list of different approaches that can be taken. And it's a question of thinking of which of these are relevant to my area of teaching and, and, and how, how they would fit in with the kind of students that um, we're engaging with. Um, it's interesting in both of the, the, the two key studies that involved, um, you know, three key studies that involved medical students, there had to be a catch to get them there which included pizza, by the way. Um, and, you know, without the catch to get them there, they wouldn't participate. But once they were there, providing them with an experience which was important to them uh, was the key for their engagement rather than mere participation. So I think it, it's, uh, it's, it's looking at these various options and as we'll be discussing in the second webinar, and seeing what one is best aligned to the kind of purposes that you're trying to achieve. How, is that helpful, Faith? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Professor Philip, um, it's Sharon. Oh, by the way, it's, please, it's Stephen. I, I only have to use a professorial title when I'm trying to get money and I'm not trying to get money from you. So Stephen, please, Sharon. Uh, Stephen. Uh, just building on what you were saying then, I'm wondering also then about how um, that engagement fits with the workplace or the facility that students are going to as well. Is that another key consideration? Sorry, I'm really having difficulty hearing you. You're saying how that plays out in terms of the, the workplace? Yes, yes. How, do, how those um, engagement strategies with workplaces that students are um, attending? Yes, and yeah, that's a very good question, Sharon, because what we know is that um, there's gonna be different kinds of experiences in the workplace and students will find it more or less engaging. That, that's, and in some sense, you can't rely upon there being effective support within the workplace. If it's there, it's terrific, um, but we know that workplaces are under enormous pressure to provide um, practicum experiences. That's why I'm suggesting that, um, you know, there's a consideration for supporting students when they're having those work experiences. And when those experiences are perhaps not always wonderful, there's a kind of support mechanism in, in place. Uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but for instance, um, again, one of the nursing studies that um, was done earlier, it was set up that there was um, a, a group of students would go into the hospital and meet and, and worked in a hospital, but they would meet up to provide support and share and compare stories. In the dietetics course, for instance, um, students go into hospitals in pairs as a way of working together in um, a busy environment and in sharing the experience. So that's, in some sense, I think we have an obligation as educators to try and reach out in some way because we can't control what happens in, in workplaces, but to reach out and try and support the students while they're there, either through you know, pairs or through processes of engagement or whatever, so I think wherever possible, we have the obligation to try and um, uh, provide support to the students, but also to provide experiences that help and enrich their experiences. I, I, I don't know if I've answered your question, Sharon, but that's, that's how I've interpreted your question. Other questions, please. Melanie. I had a quick question about the briefing and the debriefing um, sort of activities. In, in my experience, so much more time seems to be spent on preparing or doing the briefing for students that are about to go out on work integrated learning, but much less on the debriefing or the making connections. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, um, it, it's it's, it's interesting, I do some work in aviation and when pilots are being um, um, assessed to retain their pilot's license and also when, for instance, they um, are moving from being the first officer to being a captain, they do all these simulations and things. The debrief is often far longer than the briefing arrangement because 
they they've got something to engage with um and you know reports on you know how the plane was flying and what how the how the the um the pilots responded to the emergencies which inevitably happen when you you've got these simulators going so for me i think the hence this focus on this post practicum that the post practicum is very important because as i said earlier the students have got something to negotiate with the other thing that i've that's come up in a couple of studies and it's not general is that um don't overdo the um um the briefing ahead of time i remember my colleague from uh, university of melbourne liz malloy uh, in one of the earlier studies she was working with physiotherapy students and you know on the monday they were about to go out and have their first engagement with patients you know actually putting their hands on warm bodies and on friday afternoon she was trying to instruct them and tell them all about adult learning theory well frankly they weren't interested they were worried about a that on monday they would be actually you know engaging with live patients and for the first time they would be um assessed by clinicians rather than how they wrote assignments so i think it's a question of being sensitive to um uh, the students themselves what they're engaging with and, uh, and by the way liz liz you know we, we laugh about the, her efforts at, on that friday afternoon and we realize it you know, so i'm not having a go at this at all we're just i'm using that as an example so i think yes it's it's probably um, a sense of balance but certainly the debriefing thing i think is the the the, the opportunity the post practicum experience is 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 the one that should be given great emphasis because by that time the students have actually had the experience they've got something they can compare contrast they've got some basis to work with and there's a whole set of questions that they come up with we also know that these authentic experiences are very informative um they they they're very important for our learning processes because a process called indi, 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 indicates in, you know, I can't even say it. Indicates hackality. Indicex index indexicality. Sorry, and it's how we index and make sense of experiences and how we record things. And when you're engaged in a practice situation, an authentic work situation, dealing with you know people or whatever work situations, it's it, these are very richly informing and, and structuring our knowledge, so that they're rich experiences and utilizing them and having questions asked about them is 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 probably very important i suspect so i don't know if that helps answer that question melanie but i think yes certainly the emphasis on post practicum seems to me to be particularly important from the various studies we've done yeah. thanks that's really helpful thank you other questions clarifications stephen um I'm Megan. Abigail's got to go. Yes. Okay. Uh, could you hear me, Stephen? I can, Megan. Yes. Yeah. I'm Meg Megan from Sydney, from Medicine. Megan, sorry. Yeah. No. I, I, I would thought being British, you would pronounce it more British way, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I, <knew. laughs> um, I I'm particularly interested in evidence-based design and better designing health facilities for learning. So I, I, it doesn't sound as if it came up as a thread at all in the work that you were doing, but I'm interested in where physically some of those sessions took place. Um, so when small groups needed to meet after, at the end of the day to discuss things and also the stability of um, technology that was being used and how that was facilitated through the particular health facilities where practicums were taking place. Did that come up at all in... Um, some yes, I mean, it, I, th I think the examples of um, of the medical students. Um, I'm trying to remember the physical location. I think most of them were on campus at Monash. Um, the, the Harrison, Julia Harrison's ones, and the ones at Notre Dame were also done on campus. But the facilities there are very close to healthcare facilities. I think. Some of the nursing ones were done in hospital settings, um, in training rooms, though, not actually in the clinical settings, in training rooms. 
So just going across, I think in most instances, it would be done in a, a training type environment. Um, and I think that was mainly just because that's students were in, working in, in different places and that's where they came together. I also have a suspicion, particularly with medical students, that um, that's a safe environment for them. Um, that, you know, the, that, that, that there wouldn't be concerns about being overheard by clinicians, et cetera. I could be wrong. That would be my, um, uh, my guess there. And the other parts of the question is, is about the, the, the techni technology and engagement. I mean, this, this data gathering was done two years ago. Um, and I think so much has changed in the last six months um, um, in terms of the use of technologies, people, students comfort with it, teachers comforts with it, um, the abilities of the interactiveness of this technology, as long as you don't have an outage like we had this morning. Um, I think it's, we've got to rethink all of this. Um, I mean, I'm a very strong believer in the face-to-face -face stuff um, for, for a pile of reasons. But I think the, the whole, the fact that people are now far more comfortable with technology have had to become comfortable with it. It's become um, you know, a common part of our practice. I think we probably need to recalibrate um, our views about the use of technology for communication. There's lots of things you, you can do and there's lots of things you can't do. But I think we probably just need to recalibrate that at the moment, I suspect. I don't know if that's helpful, but there's so much has changed in the last six months. I think we just need to take stock of all of that. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. And, and I appreciate your distinction between work integrated education and work integrated learning. I think in particular, I'm interested in the, the learning part of things and the activities that might happen in corridors, liminal spaces, interstitial spaces, whatever you want to call them, um, you know, next to the sometimes next to the dirty linen trolley, no, outside the dirty utility room next to the t linen trolley, which is not ideal, and how yeah. we might better design those and how yeah. then you might link in the technology with that. And yeah, of course, you're absolutely correct, I think, that um, yeah. so much has changed because of the pandemic. Yes, and one of the reasons I think that's important is what I've seen with the discourse of lifelong learning and lifelong education get very distorted um, because an awful lot of what governments and government agencies talk about lifelong learning is actually lifelong education, the provision of courses. Now, one of the problems with that is that most adults, for instance, don't spend much time in education institutions. They spend lots of time in workplaces, in the community, et cetera. But when you look at the kind of um, policy framing globally and through global agencies such as OECD, et cetera, um, that um, the, the, there's... You know, words are used like lifelong learning when actual fact they're talking about lifelong education and the actual how it is, is manifested is actually very narrow and excludes um, you know, people learning through their work and people engaging with community, et cetera, et cetera. Hence, I'm just trying to um, try and prevent that, the conflation of those two terms by making the distinction to set them apart. Thanks. Other questions? I'm not quite sure how we're going for time. I think we've got plenty of time, but I'm sensing the group isn't terribly large. And so I'm wondering if, if it's fruitful to go to group processes or should we continue just to have a discussion? And when the discussion finishes, we um, would complete the session. Um, um, just Sammy, how many folk have we got? I'm only seeing about 10, is that correct? Yeah. Well? So we could either do, um, Stephen, we could either do two breakout rooms and then it would have four in, four people in one and five in another. Yeah. Or if we wanted to make smaller groups and we could do three groups with three people in it. No, two groups sounds fine. I mean, if okay. people want to go into those groups, then we've got a set of questions for you to address. Um, you can address those questions and then we'll come back and get some responses from you if, 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 if that would be, that would be good. So is there any, um, um, is there any um, um, other queries we'd like to go to before we go into our very small groups? Um, people are leaving at the moment, perhaps um, this won't work out. Um, um, yeah, so how many people we've got in groups then? Megan, Heidi, Kathy, uh, Leah, and Heather, Hi. and Amy. Um, 
okay, perhaps we go for two groups and then people can work in those groups for about, say, 20 minutes and then we'll come back together again. How does that sound? Yeah, I think that sounds good. Um, well, um, Faith is now saying do one large group. Sure, I can do that as well. Yeah. Okay, so allow people to discuss those questions and then we'll come back and have a sort of um, uh, a little plenary session. Sure. And did you want them to go for about 10 minutes or? Well, perhaps, perhaps 10 or 20 minutes and then people can then uh, indicate they can come back in and we'll just finish up. Yeah. Sure, okay. Have a I'll, concluding I'll session. Just break everyone out into the room. Yeah. Um, it will, the timer will tell everyone once, uh, it'll do a yep. countdown when the 20 minutes is up. Yeah. Okay. Heidi uh, and Amy, are you having trouble going to the rooms? Oh, Heidi's gone. Amy? Did you need help going into the room? Sometimes when you're on your phone, it doesn't work so well going into the breakout room. I'm on my phone. I haven't gone into a room either, Samia. Oh, Faith, I didn't put you in a room. All right, okay. Perhaps Amy's gone to make a cup of tea. Yeah, and I think oh, she had some trouble signing in too. Oh, um, okay, yes. Yeah, and she just said she did it at night shift. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm just going to pause the recording while everyone's in a breakout room. Okay. Yeah. Ah, we, that's good. Back. So we everyone's back faces. now. We have faces. Yeah. This is good. Yes. Yeah. That's good. Um, so how did your discussions go about the purposes for, um, for post-practicum interventions? Would somebody like to lead the conversation? Don't make me point. I'm happy to jump in. Thank you, Melanie. <laughs> we, we chatted about a few different things. Um, I think we chatted about really sort of opening students' eyes to different career paths and, and how the sort of post-practicum experience can really help to achieve that. Um, and then we sort of got in a, into a bit of a discussion about where will is placed. So, you know, if it's placed too late, they can't, students really can't then, you know, make a decision about their professional identity. It's almost too late at that point. So having some work integrated learning experiences quite early. Um, and then I guess really connecting that theory to, to practice. So drawing the connections between what they're learning in the classroom and, and then what they're learning in the workplace. And they were sort of the broad themes of what we chatted about. I don't know if anyone wants yeah. to add in and add anything. Yes. Um, I remember, I mean, Megan, I think, would, is it Megan or Megan? Sorry, I've forgotten. I was, yeah. Yeah, you're muted. Now you're, going, so, now you're going to second guess yourself every time you try to say. I know that. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Uh, Just call me Meg. Maybe that's easier. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, for instance, I, I, I've done work earlier in um, with medical students, and uh, medical students have very different different experiences in different areas of uh, medical work, and um, many of them find their time in surgery quite confronting and difficult. And whereas they find the atmosphere in pediatrics um, very, very different than surgery to take a comparison. So students can actually have um, experiences that 
formulate their views about where they want, in that instance, what specialism they want to do later. But it can be very important that also there's some process that helps them understand what's going on and, um, and how they can uh, make sense of that experience. Because that's, that's a big career choice of somebody saying, I want to do this medical specialism or that medical specialism. And, um, or I want to be this kind of nurse or that kind of nurse. So um, um, yes, I think it's great to have the experiences and, um, and have the opportunity to dis discuss um, the different experiences they had. And that can be very important for career choice. In, in one of the earlier studies, um, there was, we did um, uh, chiropractic, was uh, the focus for colleagues in, um, in Murdoch in Western Australia. And that was fascinating because what happened was the chiropractic students, um, I've told this story many times, by the way, chiropractic students organized in Murdoch, organized to go and help a community in a, a stateless community in Northern India. Um, and this was a community that had fled Burma generations ago and they went to this community, they paid for their own airfares and they raised money to go there and worked in the community for, for two weeks, helping these people. Because these people make it a living by breaking rocks. Children broke rocks, parents broke rocks and grandparents broke rocks for road base. That's how the community survived. And they, so they went there and did their chiropractic work. Um, and when they came back, they were debriefing to use that expression the, the cohort of students they were with, some of whom hadn't been. Um, and what's, what came out of the discussion is that there is two very different philosophies um, in chiropractic work. One is about continuity of care. So you have the care for somebody over their life. And the other is you intervene when the person hurts their body. And this raised, this was discussed in quite heated terms because these young people came back feeling that they'd done this good work and looking after these people for two weeks. And yet some of the other students said, how dare you go there and do that? How dare you do that for two weeks and not, and then withdraw? Um, and so it was a very interesting conversation. I've seen the transcripts of it, I wasn't there, but it, it really got down to the fundamentals of what this occupation was about and how you should conduct your self in that occupation because there was two very distinct views about it and that was of course was relevant because these people might end up working in remote indigenous communities and should they just go in and out or should they have a constant presence there which is probably very difficult um, so those kind of conversations can be very powerful the good by the way the good the nice part of that story was by the way that the um, these students who'd organized this then contacted peers um, in other Australian universities and, and universities in New Zealand, and they organized so that chiropractic students would rotate through that community in Northern India. So they actually gave them um, a form of continuity of care and they raised money to build a school for them as well. So um, yeah, so these, these conversations can be you know, helpful at a personal level in terms of understanding where you want to go, but also can be very helpful for understanding the essence of the occupation, you know, what it's about and perhaps not, uh, what it's not about. And I think that's particularly important when you have um, areas of the occupation which are seen to be unfashionable or whatever, you know, like aged care for, for nursing and how positive stories about aged care can be used, for instance, to encourage more healthcare practitioners to work in them. Was the, ethic, thing, was the ethical or philosophical um, tension or conflict if you like in that came up in that discussion anticipated for those students and was it a facilitated session or it was a facilitated conversation um and i don't think i i, I think people were taken back by it um and you can understand it from both perspectives you can understand that these young people had raised money they'd slept rough you know they hadn't been staying in hotels they'd raised money but not for their own travel they'd paid for that and so from their perspective, they'd done a good thing. Mm. Um, and then they were talking about this good thing they'd done and some of their peers turned on them and said, well, I'm not sure this is such a good thing. Um, and the uh, Mari who uh, was facilitating the session talked about the way, and apparently the outcome was amicable, 
um, but it just it got to the uh, you know the fundamental issue of, of what the practice was about and there are two two very different views uh, within the practice which perhaps hadn't been you know perhaps which had been discussed as a classroom issue but then when the real instances were provided there was also they were using placebos as well and I, and I forget I forget the issues with placebos now but they were saying, you know, that was part of the how dare you type stuff as well. Um, um, so, yeah, so that was that was that exploring something in, 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 that's fundament, fun, fundamental to the occupation, you know, the canons of the occupation, as it were. Yeah. Other um, comments that um, are things you discussed? Oh, yeah. Catherine. Right, Stephen, uh, I, I think some of the things that we discussed as well kind of sit around this notion of purpose um, and why we're getting students and how we engage them in this post practicum um, experience. And I think for them to walk away without us having done that means that we have done them a disservice because we haven't allowed them to voice or articulate that actually this was a, an awful experience or it was an enlightening experience. It's shown me uh, through my degree that there's a left or a right hand turn that I could take and that it's okay to do that. It's okay to not have had a good time, mm -hmm. but provide them with the pastoral care and the support to be able to analyze why it wasn't. Um, yeah. Yeah. a positive experience and what do they do with that yes um, because there yeah. is there's still going to be a positive and what we tend to do in service learning is they're keeping a reflective journal and talking about those aha moments and the yeah. crikey this has just happened and I, this is not what i expected at all yeah uh, or i'm challenged by something yes and yes. our final piece of assessment i was um, telling the group is a video cv and that video CV allows them to do a number of things. They can articulate um, what are the skills that they developed? What was that skills gap analysis mm. at the beginning? What did they learn? Mm. What do they still need to learn? What mm. career insights has it given? It gives them a practical experience in talking mm. to an employer. What does this internship experience mean for you? Yeah. Um, what were some of the challenges that you had and how did you overcome them? <clears throat> did you complete the plan that you thought or did you learn more or less? You know, those kinds of things. Yes. And I think giving purpose to the assessment um, so that the student knows what's in it for them, not what's in it for us, but what's in it for them. Mm. Um, what will they do with the assessment outcome? Mm. What mm. will it help them to achieve, I think, is mm. a really important aspect mm. in mm. terms of these real life experiences that they go through. Yes, yes. And to become aware of things. And I think it's, it is very important that when people have bad experiences, we try and support that and try and work out why it is. Again, a story I've told many times is that in, in the, um, the big national project, the first one, um, in journalism, the students from Griffith, um, there was this interesting thing that what happened was the journalism students went off to the various print and media journalist place and a, a number of them went off to a, um, a, a television station, you know, privately owned television station. I'll not mention which channel it is. Um, and what happened was all of the men came back and said, oh, the experience I had was really ordinary. I was put in the corner. They gave me boring jobs to do, photocopying, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't very interesting. And then the women came back and, and said, oh, I actually had a great time. It's doing all sorts of interesting things, doing stories, doing face-to-face -face camera, going up in the news helicopter. But it was only when you put the her group together, everybody realized what was going on. And that is, heaven forbid, this such a thing would occur. But the men in the, in the television station were trying to hit onto the young women. And of course, weren't interested in the men. And so, but it was only bringing them together that they realized what was going on and probably learned a lot about workplace stuff as well. Um, but otherwise, the men would have thought that there's nothing interesting in that form of journalism. Um, so it was good having that shared 
um, that, that shared experiences. Another example which um, Meg will probably relate to is um, um, one of the early studies with medical students um, reported having, most of them report having a, a, a very difficult time when they do their experience in surgery that they, one of them described it as Gaza Strip um, and that it seemed, you know, they often said that it seemed like the surgeons were doing their best to reduce the students to tears. Um, and yet there was one woman who said that she didn't find the surgery experience difficult. And she was a mature woman, um, a mature medical student, and she was a woman of stature, as it were. And um, we asked her about her experience and why it contrasted with the other students' experience. And the story she told was that she was actually from New Zealand and that her parents had both been doctors and decided she didn't want to be a doctor because she saw that her parents work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, but later in life decided to become a doctor. But she said that when she went into surgery, she knew it was a critical area. So how she behaved, how she prepared and where she positioned herself took into account of all of that. And what she suggested was that perhaps some of the younger medical students simply were just um, weren't adequately prepared and sort of got in the way um, and could have perhaps. So there was an interesting lesson in terms of how, when this bad experience happened, we were able to sit down and say, well, how could that be more positive? And a lot of it was about preparation and sensitiveness to the circumstance that um, the, the students were engaging in. A dramatic sort of instance, but I, I think we, that's a good reason for doing these, the, these um, understanding the experiences they have and how we can address them in the future. Hi. Heather. Hi, hi. Um, it's interesting point to bring up about the, the workplace, um, what's happening in the workplace, and maybe the students are seeing things that perhaps other people who are already working there don't see, like they've got fresh eyes that they're bringing to the place. And I wonder, in preparing students for that experience, um, how we can also uh, introduce to students what their rights are and what their responsibilities are. And I feel like that's a really big area that hasn't really been touched very much. Do you know what I mean? Um, because, you know, students, you know, the women students shouldn't be being hit on by the, by the um, people in the, um, working in the media, you know, and, you know, they shouldn't, they shouldn't have those sorts of experiences, but also the students themselves should know what to do when that does happen. And I wonder in part of that debrief at the end, when those things have come to light, what we could do with that to support the students, but also and improve the program and also look at how can we make positive change to the workplace as well? Yes. Yes, I mean, yes, I think that, that that's that's quite correct. And it, it was it was in the debrief that all that stuff came out. Um, so I think that's a that, that, that's an important point. Um, Catherine. Um, I was just going to say that we actually do that in service learning as part of the first piece of assessment. Um, we talk about young workers or workers rights. Um, we talk about um, bullying. We show them where to locate. Um, the university's policies, etc. Um, so they need to actually engage in that, and they actually do um, a, a short um, uh, risk analysis for themselves. So we actually have a risk register for the course that's generalised. So what types of activities students might be doing that are people yeah. related, yeah. that are internship related, or whatever. So they actually identify some of those things and start to ask questions of their workplace supervisor as well, because they're submitting yeah. that in week four. So throughout all of that, we're also talking to them the whole time to say, they actually make a declaration, very quick declaration. I understand that if I'm made to be feeling uncomfortable, um, challenged, whatever it is, what the process is, and that's come to me or to whomever. So I think that is part of the prep mm. that we must, yeah. must yeah. do. Yeah. I've, I felt quite despondent over the years about the lack of change since I graduated in 1983. <laughs> but I have to say that um, I'm probably more optimistic now than I've been for some time um, from a, you know, the, a, a sort of the, the stereotypic example, but I'm afraid there's a big reality behind it of surgery. Mm -hmm. I think they're, 
there, a few things have come together, um, at least in Australia and New Zealand, uh, with the, uh, I think it was 2014, and Gabrielle McMullen, um, who's launched a book and spoke about um, uh, abuses within the surgery profession yeah. and the College of Surgeons is doing a lot. Um, and then the timeliness of the Me Too movement and unfortunately the Harvey Weinstein case, those sorts of things. I hope there's a confluence that will start to in, um, improve things. But I have worked in student support for quite a while and it's very, very difficult to persuade students that they identify those um, Issue, yeah. some of those issues um, yeah. and as they go into it becomes even more problematic mm -hmm. as they go into being junior medical officers I imagine it's the same in similar profession in other yeah. professions I um, mean uh, the law uh, the legal profession there's been some more about that recently with Supreme Court judges and those sorts of yes. things yeah. um, so but I, I as I say I think I feel a little more optimistic about that than I have for some time <laughs> yeah I mean just last night the stuff on television about to federal ministers. I mean, the fact that it's been exposed in that way is, you know, people felt comfortable about exposing that stuff. That was, um, so the cam camera bubble is being opened up in that way. I mean, but one other thing that does happen when students go into the workplace is that you can't, you can't plan for everything. Unexpected things happen. Um, I've, for instance, I was observing in a hospital ward once when there was a code blue and right next to me, a patient had a heart attack and I was there when the, 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 what do they call the nurses who do the resus, they come up and came up and essentially pushed the doctors away and did the task of resuscitating the patient all in front of me. Now I could have, I mean, a, a student nurse or doctor could have visited that ward a hundred times and not experienced that. And so there's the happen chance thing which occurs. And I know for instance, um, that in midwifery, uh, the studies I've done in midwifery, the, the midwifery students are told that there's only certain things you can do, um, but then all of a sudden they find themselves in a hospital ward somewhere where the, the midwife says, you know, you know, you're helping me deliver a baby, you know, um, and they don't feel, and rightly or wrongly, and I, I don't know what's right or wrong about this one, by the way, that um, they feel that they have to, but they're also quite happy to help deliver the baby, even though they're not supposed to do that until next year or something, that um, perhaps it's a lack of empowerment, but also perhaps uh, if the midwife says it's safe, it, it, it's safe. So these unexpected things occur because things happen in practice, which, you know, are unplanned and unintended, not unintended because they happen, but it's not as controllable, I guess, as an educational environment. And sometimes those can be very, very important, very important learnings. <clears throat> All right, any other um, comments? Thank you for this, for staying with the, the process. Um, this has been good. Um, I'll just mention that next week, what we'll be looking at is these series of, of interventions, which we used in both phases of that study, the ones from health and social care, and then the ones across a broader range. And so as to look at something of the variety of approaches that were taken by the projects, and you'll be able to see a, a, a greater sense of, of, of what happened um, in those and the kind of strategies that we use, what worked and what didn't work. Um, and then the, the third one will be on how we engage students, time jealous students, which um, I think is a real challenge for, for, for higher education at the moment. Yeah. So I don't know if there's any um, other um, uh, uh, questions or queries. The PowerPoint I used will be very shortly available to you um, and um, you can access that. And if there's any further questions you want a particular issue, please feel free to contact me. Very happy to take your comments and um, I, I hope you found this session um, helpful um, in some way and useful. So thank you very much for participating. Thank you, Stephen. Oh, Thank you. Um, we'll put in the chat quickly your links to your um, web page and your blog as well, if people want to for future reference as well. And I will, if people are coming along to the next one, we will be sending out an email uh, next Monday with the Zoom link and everything like that. Okay. Okay. Thank All you. the best. Look after yourself. Have a lovely day. Thank See you. Ya. Bye. 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 -bye.